thank you for joining us today for our inaugural Breaking Barriers and Wonder Women of Athletics as we celebrate um, Women's History Month here in Lion Athletics. We're very privileged today to be joined by most of our executive team. We have one new member in transition, but from an athletics perspective, as you can see, um, we're a much smarter athletics executive team than we used to be because it's five, about to be six females and three males, but we're, we're going to celebrate a lot of things and discuss a lot of things today. Um, and specifically, we're going to talk about breaking barriers and celebrating these Wonder Women of Athletics and how, as we see throughout our profession and throughout the country, that we hope eventually seeing women in positions of leadership and influence is not an exception, but rather more of a norm. So before we get into it a little bit, just want to thank each of you today for your time. We've got five very talented female executive leaders in our department. They're going to introduce themselves very shortly. And we're joined also um, by Sherrod Williams and Josh Mank. They'll introduce themselves here very shortly and to get that male perspective because when we celebrate, you know, whether it was last month with Black History Month, Women's History Month, the, the, the purpose of this panel today is to raise awareness and consciousness within the diversity of our four strategic pillar in our department diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so there's, this is one of those things in, in our minds as executive leadership, we're, this isn't just a one or two session topic conversation that hopefully creates conversations. Sherrod and I often use the term pin tweet. Um, so it's just a, it, it, it's an ongoing dialogue and it's top of mind, not just something that shuffles to the bottom of the newsfeed metaphorically after we do this session. So. We appreciate uh, this group for giving us a little bit of time today, and we're, we've got a few questions for each of you. Let's start um, here on, I'm gonna start actually on my uh, left of screen. Um, Jess, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, Jess is administrative associate to the athletics director, so she's got the worst and hardest job <laughs> maybe on the screen. Uh, but Jess, uh, she sort of keeps the department uh, running, which is quite a, some days, but Jess, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. Um, hey, everyone. So again, I'm Jess Diaz. I'm the administrative associate to the AD here at Commerce. Um, I did my undergrad at uh, Cal State Long Beach, where I played was a water polo student athlete there. Um, I graduated in 2017, um, had a great time with it. And then after that, I went to UCLA um, for my internship. I was there for two years, did one year in academics and one year in student athlete development. Um, after that, I transitioned over to Baylor University here in Texas, and I did character formation there, which is their version of student athlete development as well. Um, had a great time doing that. And um, after, once the pandemic hit, after those eight months of in between, I was great, very grateful to end up here at Commerce. So um, I'm here now having a great time with this exec team and very grateful to be on this panel today. Fantastic. Victoria? So hi, everybody. I am Victoria Kislak. I am the Associate Athletic Director for Student Athlete Success. I am um, originally from Houston, Texas, went to the University of Tennessee uh, for undergrad, worked for men's basketball, then decided to take a leap and went to Louisiana State University um, and did my graduate assistantship there in what was media training that became student development, much like Jess, um, and then interned at the University of Houston in football academics and then uh, we're almost about to hit six years at Commerce, so I've been here. I've been different positions, different roles, uh, but have been here, and this has become family. Thank you. Kate? Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Bruning. I'm the Associate Athletics Director for Sports Medicine. Um, I'm originally from Northwest Ohio. I went to Ashland University, another Division II school as an undergrad, started out as an athletic training major there, and kind of built my love for the sports medicine world connected to sports. Um, I, from there, I went uh, to Moorhead State University down in Kentucky and was a graduate assistant athletic trainer working specifically with their women's soccer team. Um, and then after that, I was given the opportunity to go back to my alma mater, Ashland University, and work as an assistant athletic trainer for almost six years working football, women's basketball and softball at different points throughout my time there. Um, and from there, I made the giant move, moved a thousand miles from home down here to Texas um, to continue in division two athletics specifically and work here at a and Commerce. Started out as senior athletic trainer uh, with football, 
and then was able to transition um, four months into being here into being the associate AD for sports medicine. And moved to Texas in the middle of July, which I thought was a most impressive. <laughs> yes. uh, the, the heat's no joke. <laughs> uh, Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Schilling. Um, I'm the senior associate AD for Championship Resources. So um, just found my passion working in college athletics in 2014 when I started um, at my alma mater, South Dakota. So that is, I'm a coyote, not a jackrabbit. Let's make that very clear. <laughs> Um, and, you know, much like Kate, um, moved to Texas, you know, after some stops down the central time zone, Kansas State, Baylor, and couldn't be happier to be in the Texas heat, honestly, especially um, after that snowstorm this winter. So I'll bring that back up. <laughs> um, but very development based external has been my passion, just meeting with donors and um, kind of tying back those relationships to the university and doing what I can to um, create some excitement um, around sports programs and then, you know, really allow donors to, to uh, give passionately and find areas where they can help and enhance the student athlete well-being. Excellent. Thanks. Karen. Hi, I'm um, Karen Allen, Senior Associate AD for Business and Administration and Senior Woman Administrator. Um, I've been in commerce for almost three years now, um, and during that time, kind of seen a lot of growth for myself personally. Um, prior to coming here, I was the Associate AD um, for Business and Communications, as well as Senior Woman Administrator at um, Shorter University in Rome, Georgia, which is also um, my two-time alma mater, <laughs> both of my degrees from there. Um, and really, in that time at Shorter, was given the opportunity to see um, what it meant to work in college athletics and what, you know, what opportunities there really are for, for not only women in, in, in this industry, but also just anyone in this industry kind of grew up as a, a sports fan, but really thought I'd work in professional sports. Um, kind of, that was my, my goal. Um, wanted to go to work every day at Turner Field, um, of, you know, for the Braves, um, and really saw what it means to work in college athletics, um, in my, um, almost eight years at Shorter and now three years here. Um, and really the time in college athletics has really um, translated into my view, translated my view of how women in sports um, can be successful, but also how it has um, you know, shaped my, um, my learning and, and different things and being an athletics administrator, but also being a female athletics administrator. Terrific, thanks. Sherrod. Yes, I'm Sherrod Williams, Associate AD for Operations and Competitive Excellence. I've been here at Commerce for going on two years, about a year and a half now. Um, went to Coker College, it's Coker University now. Got both of my degrees there. Um, and really, you know, just been working in college athletics ever since. Was fortunate enough to work under Lynn Griffin, Dr. Lynn Griffin, who's still there, an amazing mentor and learn from her as well as other great women in the industry. And they've really been, you know, a lot of the best mentors and friends in this industry for me um, along the way with character development, as well as learning the ropes from the external space, which is, you know, not always common, but I've been fortunate enough to learn from amazing women. And I'm just here to celebrate the women on our athlete, on our executive team, as well as in our actual athletic department as well. And, you know, just here to amplify the voices of the amazing women that uh, are here. Great, Sherrod, thank you. And last and certainly not least, Josh, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, I'm Josh Mank. I am the Senior Associate AD for Strategic Communications. Um, and I have an atypical path to get where I've gotten. I have I never had any intention to work in college athletics until I uh, snuck into an internship in the year 2006, which makes me higher up the uh, age bracket than most of the people on this call. Uh, I was an intern uh, for communications at Newberry College in South Carolina, a Division II school, and was supposed to be there for nine months. And I thought I'd get out and go into the media space again. And then I stayed there for 10 years. Uh, and now I've been at AM Commerce for five years now and worked my way up to senior associate AD uh, just through skill set, chance, and luck. Uh, a little bit of hard work here and there, depending on the day. Um, but I uh, couldn't be happier to have taken the path I have 
Um, I think I bring a different perspective than a lot of people because I still think it any have that little voice in my head that at any moment that I won't be able to work in college athletics. I don't know why that's just my personality. Uh, but so I, I think I like to try and bring a different perspective and uh, happy to be on this. Josh is a true communications professional. He went with most of the people on the call instead of saying just one. So. Uh, I also deal in statistics and facts a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's appreciated, but this is a women's panel. So we'll get back on the, uh, <laughs> on topic. Um, let, I'm going to open it up and I certainly want this to be free flowing dialogue. And, and as we all know on these type of sessions, as we've learned to socially distance and produce zoom calls, but maybe not perfect them that I think it's okay. Occasionally if there is a little bit of unintentional interruption engagement. So I, I know our, um, our viewers today will, will, will certainly appreciate that. So let's just start it off. And I'd really like us to talk, you know, a little bit. We're in a profession um, where generally there are traditionally male, you know, male unit heads, male ADs, male coaches, um, whether it's male or female sports. So, and I, I, I'm just going to open it up. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to target um, anyone, but I'd like somebody to start off the conversation just talk about that, you, you know, in those gender stereotypes, let's talk about the perspective there of, of, of that gender bias, maybe some landmark disappointing moments in your own careers um, or things you've seen that give you hope about where we're headed. I mean, I can start. Um, obviously, uh, sports medicine departments traditionally um, are ran by men. Um, that's just over time, it's been a male dominated field. I would say that's changing significantly, especially in the last probably 10 to 15 years since I've been coming up um, in this profession. But it traditionally has been overseen and been a male dominant field. I know for me, I started out wanting to work football. Um, as a freshman in college, that was my first uh, observation experience was being an athletic training student with football. And the first day I was like, this is it. This is where I want to be. I want to be on the sidelines. I want to be with a football team. Um, and I started, I think, like a lot of us wanting to work in professional sports. And then that kind of changed. But football obviously is a very male dominant sport, not completely, but definitely male dominated. So just for me, I've had many experiences where conversations have been had about sport assignments. Um, what sports should you work or shouldn't work? And I'm the one sitting here like, I want to work football. And I've actually had two different um, instances where I was transitioning to new jobs and conversations were had about, you know, what sports I should work. And I was like, well, I want to work football or I want to work baseball. I want to, you know, well, we don't know if that'll work because the coach won't want to pay for another hotel room. I'm like, wait a minute. So it has nothing to do with my skill set. It has nothing to do with what I bring to the table, but you're telling me you don't want to pay for another hotel room on road trips. Like it wasn't, it not, again, nothing to do. I was never told, oh, well, you're not qualified to work football because I was, or you're not qualified to work baseball because I was. It was just, well, we need to see. So I, I think it's changing again, especially in the sports medicine world, sports in general, obviously, but definitely in our field, a lot of our programs, undergraduate programs are dominated by women, which is great to see. And now I think that's becoming less of a stigma, but it's definitely something that I've worked through and just had to kind of stand up for myself and say, you know, hey, I'm here and I, I want to do this. And if you won't let me do it, I'm going to go somewhere where they will um, and just keep persevering through it, I guess. So, th I mean, that's my experience. And I know everyone on the screen has similar ones to that that can relate for sure. So... Yeah, that was tremendous. Thank you, Kate. I'll jump into I um, I'll start by saying I've been nothing but empowered in this industry by um, a lot of my male bosses and colleagues and teammates, three of them on this call. Um, every step of the way, I've had great uh, men who advocate for women to be in this industry and um, really push to kind of change the dynamic because I think they do understand why um, this is a, you know, a stereotypical male-dominated industry. And so they really see the value of bringing women um, in and it's been very communicated. And so I just want to start by saying, you know, thank you to you three. And there's a reason why 
you're all, you're on this call because you've been tremendous in that area and we've seen it. It's, you know, not fake. It's super genuine. Um, a lot of the coaches here. Um, and then, like I said, just for me personally in my previous stops, but it's a little different for me on the, I think external side, because um, you just have to be really intentional about, you know, like for me, there's things that I do that I would never, you know, I would never wear or things I would never say, or um, you just have to almost, and not, not in a rude way, but you almost have to overcorrect for being the only, only female. Like there's a lot of times when I'm the only female in the room, the only female at the table, the only female in the meeting. And I know that's not specific just to Erica, um, but you really have to be, I just have some things that in my head that are, I'm aware of um, and very, you know, not careful, but maybe careful about of how I say or what I do specifically just because of that, that I am the only, the only girl or only female in the room. And, you know, sometimes there are comments and we've gotten away from them, but, you know, there are a lot of comments where it's like, well, you can hold your own, even though we're all males. And it's like, yeah, no, no kidding. I can. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I mean, that shouldn't, that shouldn't shock anyone. Right. And so um, just some of like just to on your question a little bit on some of the disappointments, some of those comments, like, you know, if I am the only one at the table and I do things really, you know, fast, um, assertive, I talk fast, walk fast. And sometimes that can come off as bossy. And, you know, a lot of times you'll get the reaction like, whoa, 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 chill out. Like it's okay. You know? And it's like, well, I just reacted the same way you reacted, but no one told you to calm down, you know? <laughs> and so just going away, I think from that, like an overreaction, there's a lot of times where I feel like I've been the calmest at the table or the calmest in the room, but it's, but if I'm a girl and I overreact, you know, a certain way, it's like, well, she's dramatic or she's crabby or she's bossy. Like, no, 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 it's, it's not that it's, I'm just, you know, bringing my opinion out and um, speaking my, you know, verbiage on it as well. So my favorite is the, she's aggressive. Yeah. Like, no, I'm just, I'm trying to get my job done and do the best thing I can. I feel you on that, Erica. <laughs> and I'll take it a little differently. So when I was leaving high school, my parents said, you can go anywhere. You can do anything. And I'm like, all right, you tell me I can't do something. I'm going to try it anyway. And my mom was like, okay, well, we'll see where you go. We'll see where you go. <laughs> I worked for men's basketball at the time. And I'm like, I'm going to be a sports agent. Like that was the vision. And I was like dead set on that. And after emailing and talking to head coaches at different programs, there was an actual head coach that told me, you're a female. I will not let you be a manager for my team. And I was like, that's impossible to tell me I'm not going to do something. And it was a division one major program. And I was like, okay, let's see what happens. So I email a head coach at what was Tennessee at the time. Bruce Pearl says, come on down. I'll meet with you whenever you're here for your visit. A very different reaction to empowering someone than going into it the other way to say you can't do something. And even though I didn't get to letter in basketball like some of the guy managers, I was still on every photo and every book that they had I was still on the website. I still now am in their Hall of Fame kind of walkway. My name is still at the bottom of the thing because I was one of the only females who was able to do that for four years at two different head coaches. But because someone told me no at a bigger school, that didn't phase me. I was going to do the thing that I wanted to do now. Am I a sports agent? No, but I learned a whole lot going through that experience. And our SID at the time was the reason that I even got into communications and what I'm doing right now. Yeah. And I'll, I mean, I'll add, you know, kind of disappointing things. I mean, I think I've seen, you know, in, in my career, um, you know, being passed over for stuff, um, you know, having come from a, a university much smaller than commerce that was, you know, a religious-based institution with, you know, traditional Baptist um, background, you know, a, a female doesn't always have a place um, in, in a place of, of, of stature, I guess. Um, and so I, I think in, in, in being there um, and being, you know, a lot of transition in the time that I was there, I felt like a lot of times I was passed over, um, even though I had more experience or more, you know better skills or you know something that a, um, a, a male didn't have. But I was still seen as you know 
it, it being my alma mater, in a lot of ways, I felt like I was still being seen as the 18 year old freshman who was coming in as a student, you know? And so I had to really, um, while it was disappointing and it hurt, I had to like say, you know what, there's something better out here for me. There's something I can bring to the table, even in this role that, you know, even if I'm not the AD or I'm not this or whatever, I, I can still add value to that organization um, and leave it better than I got there with. And so I think for a lot of us, it's probably, you know, we've, we've grown the most in, in the disappointing times and in the times where it was tough. And so I think, you know, as a woman, we have to be, be able to recognize that that's going to happen um, and be able to learn from it and move on um, to, to the better things that we, you know, all know are out there. I can kind of bounce off of what Victoria said earlier and completely understand with Karen, what she was saying with that. But um, my parents kind of did the same thing that Victoria's parents did. Like, you're going to be great no matter what you do. It doesn't matter. Like, go be great. And that was kind of what my dad has, had instilled in me and being my sister and I are kind of the only, there's two other women in our family, like of the cousins and the family, like we're in a family full of men. So it's just like wanting to keep up with them. And I grew up in high school playing with the boys. Like we weren't allowed to play in the games, but I went to practices with the boys. I went to lifting with the boys. Like I, it just never occurred to me that that was different anywhere else. You know what I mean? So that was something very new to me. And I guess I never really noticed that I was the only woman in the room until I started working in college athletics. And not, that wasn't a bad thing. But once I got there, I was like, okay, wow, this is a different change for me. I'm coming in as an intern, like wanting to be great and wanting to do that, but having not wanting to step on toes or anything, especially because when I was an intern, second, I was the only woman in the room. So trying to make sure that I was wanting to be quiet and wanting to not express my voice, wanting to express opinion at the same time. So I tried to be one, to, like when I went to conferences, I remember meeting with, remember being, watching a panel and Lacey came up to me and was like, hey, I remember you from this for your, your energy with it because you were the first one to speak when asked the question. You were the first one to do this. So that never occurred to me that there was, should be anything different. I have an opinion and I want to speak it, then I'm going to like, and respectfully speak it, but still speak it and trying not to be that loud person in the room, but at the same time, bring good content to it. So um, that's kind of really my big thing with it, but I wanted to work. One of my big goals is to work in football. I want to kind of go into recruiting and try to do that. And maybe a DFO one day or something along those lines. So I think that I never really saw that as an opportunity for me until I got to Baylor. So when I was at UCLA, there wasn't a whole lot of, because I was an intern, there wasn't a whole lot of interaction with football. It was very closed off. And even looking at the coaching staff, it was all men. And I never thought, I'm like, okay, football is a men, men's world. Like, I'm just not going to be able to break into it. That's just what I thought it was. But coming to Baylor, I saw Morgan on the staff. She was the director of on-campus recruiting. I saw an assistant to the head coach. I saw Erica as chief of staff up there, like working with football. So I, I was like, okay, then maybe I can step into there. So I think that's an interesting concept, concept for younger women to see people re like representing. And I never understood that until recently of like, oh, you have to see your representation in roles of power that you want to get to. Because I never saw it as an option in football until I got to Baylor and saw people doing it there and saw people doing it here. So that's kind of my experience with it. And I think that's been really cool to see and be, be on it now, physically be on exec team and helping with that. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, gentlemen, anything to add to those comments? Well, it, for me, it's, it, it's obviously something that I can't experience these things the same way. I've tried to be equitable in hiring over the course of my 14 years as a hiring manager. Um, I think I've only had one woman who's reported to me, though, over the course of that time. Part of that's been, uh, luckily, a lot of them have interviewed and gotten better jobs. And so I've moved down the chain to get the man. That's, that, that's mm -hmm. lucky. Uh, the one I have, who I believe she's an assistant commissioner in a D division one conference now. So th that looks good. Uh, but in our profession in communications, we're within athletics, we're the ones that interact with other schools on an equal basis more often, I think, than most. And so I, I interact with a lot of people around the nation. And some of my closest friends are females in the industry and award-winning females as well, uh, who have won our Rising Star Award in, within COSIDA, which is our professional organization, which is people who have been full-time employed less than 10 years. Um, some of them are in the NCAA tournament bubble in San Antonio right now. 
with power five teams. Some of them have been a football contact for a power five football team, but they're also, I would say extremely lucky because they are talented, hardworking, and have gotten good opportunities. Um, I'm looking at the statistics right now from our COSIDA uh, membership survey that was put out uh, just before the pandemic. 81% of our profession is male. 91% of our profession is white and 51% of them are 35 and older, which unfortunately now includes me. So I am in all those. But if you think about it across the all three divisions, of the NCAA, the NAI and the two-year colleges, that's a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. We have three full-time positions in our department. That's a little high for division two. But when you look at division one, that's like, that's usually somewhere between five and nine uh, full-time positions per division one school. And it's still only 19% of that is female. And there's like, you all, as a hiring manager, you always go into it saying, I want to hire the best person for the job. And I think that's hundred percent true, whether it's male, female, uh, black, brown, green, yellow, purple, whatever, you want to hire the best person, but you can't tell me that only 19% of the best people are female in our profession. It just doesn't work that way. And then with, as you go higher up, obviously, you're going to make more money the longer you've been in a profession. Only 65% of our membership make over $55,000 a year, which goes a long way in commerce, but we've got people who work in New York City, San Francisco, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So that uh, when you look at a national average, that's not great. 76% of those 19% females, 76% make less than $55,000 a year versus only 62% of males who make less than $55,000 a year. So not only are there fewer women, they're getting paid less too, which, I mean, I am try to keep my language nice on these things. It's hot garbage. There's uh, <laughs> not better, there's not a good way to do that. Or that's not the right way to do that. I'm sorry, that's the right thing to say. And so like, it gets me fired up. Like I honestly, when you look around the screen and I'm the, I'm the middle-aged white guy, you know, I, I am the, the it, it's when you talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, you have me on there. It's probably kind of weird to say, but you have to fight for people, you know, you fight for people who to have opportunity. And that's, that's what I can do. And it just kind of gets me fired up here on a Wednesday morning, right before lunch. And, and now my blood's boiling that, you know, people have to deal with this. We love you, Josh. Keep going, <laughs> Josh. Go ahead. All right. Y'all know uh, I get Sherrod, fired up Sherrod, about you have much. the challenge and privilege of following that. I, mean, I, wrote data. I, I think the great thing about Josh is he noted on the fact that like, you know, he kind of falls into that space being like, you know, a middle aged white man in our profession, whether it's communications or other spaces that, you know, he challenges that in his quo, he fights for people like, you know, it, I, and I take it a step forward. This is about women, but like Josh challenges status quo for everybody that would fall in an underrepresented group. And he does it without being asked, right? Mm -hmm. That's the that's the great thing about him. And that's what I'll leave for him because this isn't about men, this is about women, but he does do it the right way. Um, I would add that in our profession, especially in the sports industry, I think it's about being intentional as well. Like I've been very intentional since I've gotten here at Commerce. And I'm so glad that like, you know, to have Tim, that empowers me to do it. Uh, Taylor, when he was over here as our super, as my supervisor, to empower me to like take on different roles in the space. Like I led our student worker intern pool of people and like very intentional about hiring people that look like our department as a whole from student athletes, as well as our campus. You know, we are a campus that has a higher population of black and brown students, Hispanic students, and women. So why doesn't our space look like that? Luckily, we were already trending the right way. I just came in and just made sure it was intentional and like on paper intentionally, right? So if you ever look at our um, GAs as well as student workers, majority of them are black and brown women. We have men that are in there as well, but you know, it's about empowering them to be the best version of themselves, to set them up to get the job after this, right? Mm -hmm. Our staffs look like that as well with people that report to the folks on this screen. We look how the industry should look. We're a snapshot of what that's supposed to look like. And that's a you know testament to the things that the women on our screen are doing, right? The colleagues that we have, like you know, my friends in the business are mostly women, and then I also am fortunate enough to hang around men that do the same thing that I do, but are genuine, right? So like we make sure to put people in the right space and then tell them, hey, you're there, 
but you're not there as a figurehead or a token. Now go do the work. We're fortunate enough to have Desiree Delora um, in our as a GA over an external. And like, you know, the one thing I told her when I hired her as a unpaid intern last year for her class was, hey, the only thing you're missing right now is finding your voice because you have it. You need to step into it. But I would challenge her and empower her that like, no, say this. You have a you have this thing. Say it. Like, bring it up. Your ideas are great. Mm-hmm. Oh, you have a great idea for the department? Bring it to me. Oh, you want 15 minutes with Tim? Hey, ask him. Like, you know, the worst thing that's gonna happen is say, hey, let's reschedule next week. And then you get into the room and like, you know, you have those opinions, you have those ideas. They need to come from you. I refuse to take any credit for anything that a woman or a minority does, even if I'm the supervisor, it's them. Like I tell them, put it on your resume. I didn't do it. I have the experience already. I need none of this, but I want to make sure that you can say that you did it and you know the way. And I think everybody on this screen, the amazing women we have here and the amazing women that we have coming in have done a really great job at empowering people and making us a learning department. I love Grey's Anatomy and you know, that's a teaching hospital. We're a teaching department. Like yeah. everything we do is very intentional and practical. Like, you know, we might pull the kids aside during the games and be like, hey, this is a chance. Like, you know, we probably dropped the ball here real quick. It's not a bad thing, but like, how do you fix it, right? In the moment, we're giving them that practical application of fixing while teaching. And that's what makes us the pipeline because those people can go in and actually do the job. And they're not just saying that, um, oh, well, I worked in this department. We're, we're diverse. No, you actually are empowered to go do the next thing. And I think that's what you all do amazing jobs at. And you've all been intentional about that. And that's what I would add to that, because all of the things you said are spot on. And I'm just privileged to get to, like, you know, work with you all and amplify the things that you do at the end of the day. I'm probably about to say the last thing I'm going to say on this panel. And I'm looking at those. uh, Well, because these aren't I'm not the voice you need to hear during this. But the thing I want to say is that when you go back to the hiring manager, hiring manager perspective of I want the best person, I can't think of how many people, women or men, that I've disqualified from a search because they did not have enough experience. You have to get it. It's sort of there's a joke in the social media world where you're required to have 15 years of experience in uh, Instagram when Instagram was invented 13 years ago. So like if you're if you don't if you don't have the opportunity for the experience, how are you going to get the experience? And so I, th- I think it's very important to be uh, very intentional about that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to all of you on here have heard me my little metaphor about data. I'm, I'm changing it now. And God and Josh, we trust everybody else has to bring data. <laughs> Please don't put me in the, that man together again. <laughs> like We like to challenge you to new height. You mentioned it earlier. No. Um, <laughs> hey, really quick before. The next question, and I was listening to your answers. Uh, it stoked something with me, and 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 all of you know because we talked about it at whatever piece your interview process was. We're, um, I really like the one thing I think we we try to do well here, certainly pre-pandemic and after we come out of it. I know as I look around the screen, everybody's involved in certainly at least their professional organization under the NACT umbrella or Casida um, <laughs> or or something with. Some of us have mentored through the NCA program. Some of us are in. Karen, I know, is in a cab mentoring deal now. I know Kate's been involved with NATA. Um, so one thing, just for perspective, to play off of what Josh just said about hiring and requirements and reality, in, in, in 2004, was my first year on the NAD committee. I got on it when I was eight years old. No, kidding. Um, and, uh, you know, we're sitting there in our, at our summer meeting, and the, the, and you got, you know, heads of development at the time I was at Texas State University, there's, you know, head of development at NC State, Virginia Tech, UCLA, and we're looking around the room, and there were 14 white males, and we're like, we, we got to do something, you know, and, and it wasn't just that, but that certainly propelled because MOA was just starting at the time, um, and, and all of us are familiar with that now because it's, it's a very prevalent professional development organization that we all utilize directly or indirectly, whether in searches or professional development. And so we created um, the NAD Women and Minority Scholarship because the, the, the big deal was, to Josh's point, 
well, how, how were development officers recruited at that time? Well, you know, Joe played football or basketball or played a sport. And, you know, let, let's get him in the good old boy network and get him fundraising. I, I mean, I really think um, that there are a lot of tremendous, as we all know, there's a lot of tremendous diversity and inclusion initiatives throughout our profession. But I would encourage anyone watching this or listening to this that, you know, wants to, to be active, get involved in those professional organizations because there are opportunities for professional development scholarships and grants and those type of things. And certainly anybody else can jump in on that thought, but two or three of you said something that I was like, we've got to, we've got to promote what we all are products of is that professional development piece. So um, any thoughts there or um, I, mean, I, think, I think I'll add, you know, um, kind of kind of when I was you know, growing up and thinking, you know, what kind of job I would have in life and wanting to work in sports, like, I didn't know what jobs were even out there. Like, I didn't know that there were, there were really these kinds of jobs in an athletic department or in a professional organization. You know, you see the athletes, you see the coaches, you see, you know, those people that are, you know, on TV every night, but like, there's so many opportunities in this industry that people just don't know about. And so, um, I mean, I think it's just important for, for not only, you know, girls to see uh, women be successful, but anyone to see anyone be successful in, in you know, the non high profile type jobs. Um, you know, I, I didn't really know like what, um, you know, what kind of job I wanted. I just knew I wanted to work in the space um, and, and working in, you know, working at Shorter and seeing, you know, our senior woman administrator at the time, like seeing Rachel do her job inspired me to want to do that job you know seeing our our I was good close friends with our assistant coach for the women's basketball team and now she's not even coaching she's like the assistant dean of of some sort of educational department at um the University of, of Augusta Augusta State I don't know exactly what the title is I think it's changed but you know seeing Christy do that job I wanted to you know be like Christy I wanted to be like Rachel I wanted to 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 be in a role that I felt would be influential, um, you know, not just because I was a female, but because I had the skills to do it. And I didn't even really know what those jobs were, or what they looked like. And so, um, you know, getting my, my feet wet in, in college athletics and being around those successful women has really shaped the way I view this job. Um, and then now being, you know, senior woman administrator, people say, so what does that even mean? And they assume that I'm, you know, just, over the women's sports or something like that. They don't understand that, you know, yes, it might in some cases tie back to more women's initiatives, but at the same time, it's, it's a seat at the table that we didn't always have. You know, it's a seat at the table to, to advocate for, you know, equity amongst everyone and to be, you know, a voice for someone who may not have a voice. And so, you know, it's, a, it's an empowering job to be able to be in this role to me. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I've got a two-part question, um, specifically probably more for the, the females on the panel, but certainly Sharon and Josh, if you have thoughts, jump in. Um, and have, have, you, have any of you ever been in a situation um, or had to overcome the stigma of being called irrational or crazy when you stood up for something that maybe you believed in or was very important to your core values? And then the second piece of the question, uh, did you, do you think your gender played into it? Um, I guess I can kind of start on this. I think a lot of times, and Erica kind of alluded to this before, we can be in a room and have maybe the same look on our face as the male across from us, but because we made that face, we have that reaction from everyone else. But I also think sometimes being a female, we're so quick to say, well, I didn't mean it that way, or I'm sorry, or maybe, excuse me, like, and we're so quick, and I said this to Erica the other day, we're so quick to say, well, I didn't really mean it that way. Well, no, I did mean it that way. And there was exactly intentionally the way I said it. So I think, yes, I've been in that situation, but it's always because a look that was given. But even if the counterpart across the table or wherever we were said the same thing, I'm like, well, wait a minute, I'm not gonna apologize because they're not apologizing. There's no reason. So I think sometimes when we hear those things as a female, because we do care and we are nurturing most 99% of the time, we're so apt to say, oh, I shouldn't have reacted that way. or I'm sorry, even if it's a disagreement between two females, we're both apt to say, oh, I didn't mean it that way. Don't get offended by, or whatever it might be. 
But that doesn't mean we have to apologize or we can't feel the way we feel because the person across from us feels the same way. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think I think that I was in that conversation with Erica and Victoria and we were talking about it and someone someone had said something like, oh, sorry, I'm just being a brat right now. And we're like, no, like we're not being a brat. Like we are being strong. This is what needs to happen. This is what we're doing. Like it's not about being a brat or being like, what do we say, assertive or something earlier. Like, no, we're trying to get the job done. And that's what matters. Like it's not, it is interesting to see those looks across the room like that. Like, and then even, I remember laughing at myself the other day of like texting someone and I put a period, like just trying to get things done versus an exclamation point. Like it's so silly that I have to overthink those things of coming across as aggressive or assertive or whatever, when I'm just trying to get stuff done. So I think that's so interesting to talk about and have those conversations around. And I think every woman, even outside of this industry has experience. So I just think that's super interesting. I, I think Jess, you just touched on the other piece of that, not just the, the looks are being accused of potentially, you know, having, being aggressive or assertive or whatever you want to call it, but also us women feeling like people are thinking that because we're women, maybe they aren't, but the looks that you get or the reactions that you get, and then having to think and like change how you respond to things or change how you present yourself because, oh, well, they're going to think I'm being aggressive. So I have to say it differently. Well, in reality, you don't have to, you shouldn't have to, right. You should be able to just be yourself and express yourself in an appropriate manner and get done what you want to get done. But we, I do it all the time. I, for a long time thought, oh my gosh, I need to like change my personality because people think I'm this aggressive, bossy woman. But in reality, I'm getting things done and I'm doing my job and I'm doing what's best for our student athletes. And I'm not hurting anybody in the process. It's just the way that they're perceiving me, maybe partially because I am a woman. I I don't know for sure every time, but you think that it is, right? We're kind of put in that situation where you're forced to kind of think that direction because it does happen a lot. So I think that's the other side of it for sure is just the, the things that you think about ahead of time, even when that isn't going on. I thought your screen name for today was supposed to be you are a lion, hear me roar. But I am woman. I am woman, hear me roar. I actually have two things on this. One of them um, involves my wife. Uh, she routinely apologizes for things that she has no business apologizing for and has done nothing wrong. I, 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 I use a line from NCIS, never apologize. Um, but, and I don't know where she got it. I don't know if it's at work. I haven't heard her do that on her work stuff when we were stuck together in the pandemic and we could hear each other work, <laughs> you know. Uh, she, but like, I don't get it. I don't know where she got it. And I'm sure that that's just part of the vocabulary now for a lot of peop- uh, women in professional settings. And then the other thing that I've noticed and how many women, when they write an email, feel the need to write with more exclamation points so they sound happier? <laughs> I it, That could just be anecdotal, but it, it, it's exactly what you're talking about. It's a, I have to sound like this. And so you, you write like a, like a cheerful person when you're like, when you're trying to get a form from across campus, like, no, it's, it's give me the form. Like, you're that's what it is. We're, def- we're definitely not cheerful about that. <laughs> but, but like, that's the point. It's like, Hey, how's it going? No, just give me, give me the form. <laughs> that's true. And I think just for me personally, I won't speak for everyone, but I do overthink it and think that I do have to apologize. Or I guess I will say, I thought because I've, you know, for the last maybe year and a half, I've, I've stopped apologizing. I'm not in the room to be quiet. I've, n- I was not brought to my job to not be aggressive. I'm not going to apologize. I'm, I'm competitive. I'm aggressive. But if someone, if you know me, you know, it's coming from a genuine place. And if you don't, <laughs> that's, you know, I've done everything I can to make sure that that piece is communicated as well. And so it's kind of like, uh, I'm, I am, I'm a gas pedal on the right type of person, put it to the floor. That's just who I'm not going to apologize for that. And nobody, I don't expect people to apologize if that's not their, you know, process of going about things, because that's why there are different people in the room. We shouldn't all be the same. We're not working the same. We don't have the same processes. They don't, I, I don't expect anyone to apologize for the way they do things, you know, unless it's rude or whatever. I'm not going to apologize for the way I do things because that is not my personality. That's not who I am. And that is, again, not why I'm in the room. 
And I'll say this, you know, Sherrod and I were talking last week and I'm all about expediting things. And I very clearly, even when Judy was, you know, in this office and I was across the way, our motto in the North side was get it done. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter by any means necessary. You got to get something done, call us, we'll get it figured out, done right here, right now. And we never apologized for that because we knew that was our kind of thing, get these things done. We know we can get it done. And so when I hear females or even student athletes that apologize, I'm like, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. If you're just trying to get things done, let's go. Like gas to the floor, no questions, figure it out. So I think the biggest thing for me is we have to stop apologizing because sometimes there's really no need. And, you know, I am a person that will say, hey, haven't seen you in a while. Have it, hope everything's well across campus. Right. But that's because the role I'm in. And if I don't keep that relationship, then people are like, oh, is Victoria mad? I haven't seen her in a while. You know, because <laughs> that's kind of, I was a communications person. So I get that side. But then I also have the side of your student services. So those people look at me and they're like, wow, that was a, not a friendly email. And, and not that I'm putting exclamation points, but sometimes I'm asking, how are you? How's the family? What's going on? even though I do have a point that I need something, but it's okay to ask those things and not come off as I want to make the world better. And everyone's having a great day on campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and you can, you can do it in a nice and polite way without being the super butterfly type approach, right? You just, I think people too, you know, if you do, if you are short and if you are, that's why I hate, I mean, I personally hate communicating through email and text because, you know, then some people will come back and be like, are you okay? you know, is everything okay? You know, just because you came off maybe a little bossy or aggressive. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. You talk to me like that. So are you okay. You know, and it's, it's just, I think the, the port, the important piece here is learning how to communicate with each other in a more progressive way, because then you'll know that person, you know, you won't even have to ask the question, right. Or you won't have to apologize because you know what, what, what each other is saying. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd, oh, go ahead, Shrad. Just... Um, I, was, I was just saying, I appreciate like what Victoria was saying and Eric was saying about the apologizing. And Victoria said, like, why? Are, like, I appreciate the people who come over when I say, oh, sorry about that. Like, well, why? Like, why should you be sorry for that? Like, and to recognize, even though it makes me uncomfortable in the moment, like, oh, I don't know. I just am. Like, I just am, I guess. But at the same time, it helps me recognize that, like, I don't need to be sorry for that. Like, I, I, if I do something, I don't want it to come across ingenuine if I do say I'm sorry for something, because so I do mean it, but I do appreciate the people who hold you accountable and make sure that you're making steps in the right direction for that. So good job. <laughs> yeah. I'm, well, and Eric, I don't, I pre, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sharon. Oh, no, I would just briefly add, um, I think all the notes that are being hit are absolutely correct. And um, the layer that I always add for people is, um, the way that men interact with women is very important, but it's very important for how men interact with men to normalize the different things that are said and done, as well as making sure that us as men and just people in general are taking into the account that women aren't monolithic, right? Like we have so many different women in spaces that it's on us to make sure that we're building the different relationships that you have to have. Like, you know, the way that a black woman is perceived in the workspace is totally different than a white woman or a Hispanic woman, depending on where they're at, is perceived differently. And it's nothing wrong if we're doing our job, which is like Erica mentioned, building those relationships, that collaboration, right? And then making sure that men see women as a actual teammate and a person that can get things accomplished. And that's why, you know, we hear people now say, as much as it's important for young girls and women to see women in positions of power, it's very important for young boys and young men to see it as well because it normalizes things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the blessing I think me and Josh has had, and I make sure that I do it with the young men that I encounter to make sure that, you know, I normalize that, that, you know, the women that you see know what they're talking about, right? Like that's one of the most random misconceptions that people think is, oh, they just there for a figurehead. No, like Karen really knows finance. Karen knows a lot of different things. I've learned a lot about finance from Karen. She happens to be a woman, but I'm not listening to her because she's a woman. I'm listening to her because she's really good at finance. I'm gonna defer to anybody in sports medicine regardless because I did not pay attention in kinesiology and all those other different uh, classes, right? Like these people know what they know 
And I think that's the important thing to always be teaching young boys, young girls, and everyone. And everything everyone said is spot on. It's that relationship part that builds the collaboration mm -hmm. that should be the focal point in a lot of the stuff that we do. And again, I continue to say it, I think we all do a really great job at doing that here and being intentional about it. We, uh, we have a couple minutes left and I, I do definitely want to get to <clears throat> at least one more question. The lead in, I would say, uh, and, and you guys know, and one thing I think the magic of this group um, is you guys have a lot of patience, I think, or at least you mask it well with adjusting because sometimes at, at a, <laughs> thank you for the eye rolls and the honesty, um, you know, it, it, and all joking aside with the age jokes at 50, I mean, the, when we got cell phones, plain paper fax machines, I can explain what fax machines are, for some of you that may not know. <laughs> but, you know, I've watched technology grow up in this profession, just like we've watched gender development. And so the mm -hmm. thing that is we, because the, the real final question is I, I want each of you to, or some of you at least to talk about the best ways to empower and lift up the, that next generation of females coming up in this profession. Um, so I want you to think about, because no matter our age, our gender, our background, all of you are going to be 50 one day. Mm -hmm. And so what are you going to do um, when you're communicating with that 24, 25, 32, 38 year old? I mean, I don't think we're going to be playing sports on Mars by then, but um, they're going to, they're going to be other technology and communication things develop. So as female leaders in this industry or leaders in this industry, how are you going to support and, and, and pay it forward, so to speak? I mean, I can, I can start. I think, you know, for me, I, you know, I think Tim mentioned I'm you know, doing that CASA mentorship right now and, and getting to talk, you know, my mentor is um, the CFO for the Air Force um, Athletic Association. Um, she is uh, Ashley Moggison. And she, when we talk, like, she, we talk like we're, you know, we're friends and it's, you know, but every time we hang up, I know I've learned something, you know, we, we spoke earlier this week and she was kind of just talking about the, you know, how their structure is within their department because they have, you know, some people on, you know, the government side of things as well as their nonprofit organization and just, you know, the differences in that and her experience with, you know, moving from, you know, a more traditional type athletic department into that role and, you know, getting to, to see her perspective on how how that operates has been really neat to me um, and then I'm you know extremely excited to do um, you know next summer start the um, D2 ADA um, mentorship um, and so um, I think you know those opportunities are great but at the same time I think it's about um, for myself personally um, you know getting involved with the students that are here on this campus you know as the you know, sport administrator for volleyball and softball, like I really had the opportunity to, to mentor those, those females. And, and, you know, maybe none of them want to be in my position. Maybe, so, maybe one of them does, you know, maybe there's someone who, you know, wants this career path and, you know, hopefully I'll be able to, you know, kind of maybe help guide them in that direction. You know, I have some, you know, great relationships with Pre, with former students from from shorter that will still call me every once in a while and just want to talk or you know they they need a reference for a job and you know for a job they're applying for and I think it's important for us um, you know not only as women but for us to give ourselves to those opportunities to allow for those to happen and for those to um, kind of happen organically and not force them um, but be open to any and all opportunities that those might um, those might be available to us because I think it's invaluable how much we can offer to to someone in our similar situation um, down the road. I think for me, and I agree, Karen, it's just continuing to be a mentor, a leader, but um, I think normalizing, just continue the normalization of it. Um, for example, we have a new teammate coming on and she absolutely killed the interview process. We didn't think she was the best because she was a female. We didn't think she was the best because she was a black female. She was the best. And she's not, you know, we all, that was a unanimous, I think, decision. And no one thought twice about 
any of her demographics, right? And we, you know, we just need to make that a normal process. Like what Josh was saying, you want to hire the best people when they're on your interview, can you know, when they're in your interview candidate pool. She was, we got her, we're lucky. We move forward and we continue that narrative, continue that dialogue, but we can continue to find ways. You know, Sherrod and I, we're, we're going through searches right now. And we've, you know, been able to empower some great people to have some interview experience and, you know, kind of teach and guide and learn. But I think it goes back to that communication, those relationships, and just really being genuine. I mean, it doesn't matter if, you know, I treat males and females the exact same way. You know, I talk to them in the exact same way, act the exact same way. And I don't know that that's the absolute right answer, but that genuine piece, that relationship piece, the normalization piece, you know, we, we move it forward and advance it. I think that's kind of my initiative and the process that, that I've created in my head. <laughs> yeah, I, I, oh, go ahead, Kate. I think just to build off of what both of you, I agree with everything both Karen and Eric have said, but for me, the other piece is just be lead by example. I, that's how I kind of live my life is I want other women to see me in this role. I want them to see me day to day, how I handle both male and female student athletes and male and female coaches and how I work as a boss, if you will, in this department. I want them to see that and I want them to see it can be done and I want them to see that it can be done well and that it doesn't matter whether I'm a male or female or whatever, that, mm -hmm. that it can be done and they see it day to day and it is normal and it is, you know, something that can be done. Um, my mentor was a, a male. My mentor was a man and he, Jeremy Hancock, Ashland University, he was a head athletic trainer and in charge of football. He is the best mentor I've ever had. And it wasn't because he treated me differently because I was a woman. He treated me the same as any other athletic training student that came to him and wanted to work in football. And he mentored me and showed me that I can do anything. It doesn't matter that I'm a, I'm a female. And there were days where I was like, I can't work in football. Jeremy, I was like, they don't want me here. You know, I, I can't make this work. And he's like, it has nothing to do with you being a girl. It has nothing to do with you being a female. You can do it. And I think Sherrod touched on that a little bit. Also showing men and young men that it's okay to mentor females too. It's okay to promote the, promote them moving up in the professions that you're in, no matter what, it doesn't matter who it is. As long as somebody's showing the people that want to be here, that they can be here and here's how you do it. So I'm a big lead by example person for sure. I completely, completely agree with that, Kate. And I, I, what I wanted to bring up is I saw something, I told Karen about it yesterday. I saw something in, on Instagram that Alex Morgan said, and it was a quote that said, um, I don't want my daughter, she goes, even though I want my daughter knowing about the first women to be in these positions, I don't want her to honestly know about them because I want it to be normal. Like I want, she's not going to grow up knowing about them because it will be a normal thing to have women in uh, positions of power, to have women represented in across all stages and across all platforms. So I thought that was a really interesting perspective of it. And I was very grateful um, to have women who were my supervisors from time from UCLA to now, honestly. I had um, Corey Pinkett uh, was my supervisor at Baylor. She was very involved in women, uh, women leaders. So she helped me kind of get into that area to learn and connect with women inside the platform and inside intercollegiate athletics. So I'm very grateful for that moment. And I'm grateful to be here to have Tim as my supervisor now, my direct supervisor, who empowers us to be women leaders, like to be in those positions of power. So I think those are all really interesting concepts to continue on and want to continue those, um, that progression towards it. So. This has um, been tremendous. Sorry, go ahead. I, I have some serious advice for any uh, females, women who are watching this, who want to get into sports, uh, who see us around i know a lot of people at our place think i'm just the picture guy or the mic guy but that's not all i do i, I know they see victoria the, she does academics yes but that's not all she does people karen's not carrying around a bag of cash so they may not know <laughs> that she's the finance person that type but of you thing. guys know of it, well <laughs> uh, but so i would encourage people to if you're interested in working sports, whether it's college athletics or not, ask us questions about what we do, why we do it, how we do it. And if I'm not the right person, 
I think we're all committed to finding you the right person. You may not need a full on mentor at this point, but you might need just need someone who shows you what you like to do. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason I said at the beginning that I don't have a traditional path into this job, I didn't know it existed. <laughs> I probably would have loved to do this as a student, but I, I didn't know it was a thing. So ask the questions because if, for instance, you do are a female who wants to get into communications, woman, I'm sorry, woman who wants to get into communications, some of my best friends, Olivia at Syracuse, Chelsea at LSU, Katie at the Missouri Valley Conference, Megan at St. Edwards, my and Amanda at Jackson, uh, North Florida. That's just the top layer. I it, like it can keep going. We can get you where you want to go, but you got to ask us questions because a we're trying to do our job. B there's 400 of you. If we don't know you want to, like we can ask a lot of questions, but we still got to find out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great points. Yep, great points. <clears throat> I will apologize for getting a little loud there at the end, even though I told people not to apologize. <laughs> Passion's our first core value. Nothing wrong with it. So, no need to apologize, Josh. No, we, no uh, need to apologize. <laughs> Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very privileged to serve alongside this executive group. Uh, I hope our student athletes, campus partners, alumni, anybody watching uh, this today, I hope you'll go to lineathletics.com, uh, look up these talented professionals on our website. Their contact information is right there. I know every single one of them uh, place an emphasis on good communication, great communication, and, and they'll be happy to respond and follow up with any questions. and we will keep these kind of dialogues going. Again, this isn't just because it's Women's History Month, but it's an opportunity to introduce awareness in the platform. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys. Go Lions.